Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. In this podcast series, we discover how individuals from across Africa shape the continent. I'm Leila Johnson Salami. And I'm Kai Nebe. Well, Leila, today we're in South Africa, the country that's home to a World Cup winning rugby team and a perennially underachieving football team. Also, it's the so-called Rainbow Nation with one of the world's most liberal and inclusive constitutions today, Leila. Yep, a very rich and culturally diverse nation, Kai, um, have to say. And I guess its name does give away the geographical <laughs> location. Yeah, that, that is that is definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, Kai, I, I do think the term Rainbow Nation does need a little bit of qualifying there. Um For most of the 20th century, at least where I'm from, South Africa was actually known for pretty much the opposite. I mean, there was nothing bright to write home about. Apartheid, political and economic repression, racism, white supremacy and a police state. Those were the key buzzwords then. Yeah, and those are also definitely true. And it's actually also the very reason the rainbow nation term was coined in post-1994 South Africa because when apartheid was abolished, it was seen as a time where, you know, this is South Africa's moment to reinvent its image and also reflect on the drastic changes that happened in South African society when apartheid was finally beaten down, you know, at least officially. Mm, True. I mean, you know, the battle against racism in South Africa has gone on, as we know, for centuries. And while heavyweights, you know, people like Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, um, Steve Biko, even Walter Sisulu and many others have rightly been acknowledged, um, the fight began much earlier before apartheid even existed, before South Africa even existed as a country. And guess what? Women were at the forefront. Okay, okay so wait, how early are we talking here, Leila? Well, I'd like to talk about Charlotte Maheke, um, a South African woman who was born in about 1871. And Kai, this story is frankly barely believable. Okay, I'm I'm listening. <laughs> Go on. Okay. So, I mean, this isn't an obvious place to start for a woman known for fighting racism. <laughs> So that's a choir. (laughs) Yep, that is a choir. Um, As a young woman, Charlotte Maheke was a singer and a very good one too. Um, Her contemporaries would refer to her as someone who had, you know, the voice of an angel. And she was so good, Kai, that she was recruited into what was called an African native choir. Sorry, I don't know if I heard you right. A what? (laughs) Okay, I mean, I did tell you that this was a strange start. Um, So it turns out that this was a thing in the late 1800s. Um, There were music groups from the African continent that would tour Europe and the United States. So in 1891, Maheke sets off on this tour. And the group proves hugely popular with audiences in Britain. Like, I mean, selling out London's Royal Albert Hall and singing for the Queen kind of pop. Wow. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And then, you know, they went on to the US and they did receive similarly rapturous attention there too. I'm leaving today. I want to be part of it. New York, New York. But Kai, then something goes wrong, you know, while in America. Their European choir leader disappears with the choir's earnings, and that then leaves the singers stranded, penniless in New York City. Oh dear. Yeah. So you know how we tell ourselves that everything happens for a reason and normally console ourselves with that? Yeah, tell me about it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, a former missionary to South Africa reads about the unfortunate band and decides to help. He's Bishop Daniel Payne of the African Methodist Church, and he invites our Charlotte Maheke to study at Wilberforce University in Ohio. Now, the university was one of America's first black colleges, okay, and some of the country's most distinguished African-American intellectuals did study there. 
So in 1901, Maheke became the first black South African woman to earn a university degree. Wow, that is like a really strange sequence of events for that kind of thing to really <laughs> happen. But yeah. but just tell me a bit more then, did Shala Maheke ever go back to South Africa after getting the degree? Well, not just that, Kai. So Maheke returns home and, you know, she sees the gross inequality that black people and especially black women suffer in a new light and decides that she wants to improve the situation. It's believed that the African-American scholar and early Pan-Africanist W.E.B. Dubois, um, who taught Maheke in America, inspired her. I mean, W.E.B. Dubois is the figure of the late 19th century. He was the philosopher and political thinker and so at the forefront of Pan-Africanism and writes about her in very glowing terms. That's Zubeda Jaffa, a South African journalist whose research revealed a pioneering role women like Maheke played in South Africa's anti-racism and equal rights struggle in the early 1900s. Women generally at that time, you know, weren't accorded their rightful place. And uh, so it wasn't specifically about her, but it was generally about women. The story of resistance was told around the male figures. And then it was told around the 50s, the women involved in the 50s, because I suppose that was the nearest memory. So so wait, Leila, around this time, weren't women's rights actually becoming, you know, coming more under the spotlight here? You know, I'm just thinking, for example, the suffragettes were also a big thing in Britain in the early 1900s. Is that right? You're absolutely right there, Kai, you know, but on a different playing field. Um, When Maheke returned to South Africa, the country was becoming increasingly segregated, yeah? And there were signs of resistance. So Charlotte Maheke attended the launch of the South African um, Native National Congress, which would become the famous African National Congress, or ANC, in 1912. And, you know, in retrospect, here's the crazy thing. Women weren't granted membership to the ANC when it started. So this was one of the few avenues in which black people could actively take part, I guess, in politics to a certain level. But she was even excluded from that. So how did she kind of continue her political activism? Well, well, (laughs) Maheke was not exactly a quitter, okay? This one was different. She went on to found the Bantu Women's League in 1912. And what sort of power did they have or what could they do? Well, amongst other things, they protested laws requiring black women to carry passes. So she gained a reputation for standing up for African women and giving them agency. Zubeda Jaffa says that Maheke's own life, where she excelled at the little schooling that she got from missionaries as a young woman, really kept her in touch with how important education was. She had a strong belief that we must do our own thing. We must you know, build our schools and get on with it. And so she did build the school and she did teach the herd boys in a village and she did all those things. There's a school in Gauteng at Everton. They only had black people teaching there. So it was African-American and it was South African black. And it's still there like that. It's still like that. I mean, this is quite a remarkable story that, you know, as you said, as you were explaining earlier, you know, just came out of this insane story of the choir and everything like that. But, you know, Leila, looking on Charlotte Macheke today, how is she really remembered? You're right, um, Kai. Like, honestly, it is very remarkable, you know. And to answer that, I kind of feel as though Jaffa kind of put it um, in the best way there. You know, she had a strong belief that we must do our own thing. So Maheke is remembered for her voice, literally and figuratively. Maheke was such a courageous and persevering leader with excellent oratory skills that, you know, even the white government invited her to speak on education and women's rights issues. So while she wasn't the only woman to fight for women's rights in South Africa at the time, she is seen as a titan of feminism. You know, she died in October 1939 in Johannesburg. And the sad thing is, though, Kai, that despite all of her efforts, less than a decade after her death, South Africa cemented the suppression of and discrimination against its black majority um, by officially introducing its policy of apartheid. 
Yeah, that and the introduction of apartheid, of course, would not have had any room for the legacies of uh, people like Charlotte Macheke, you know, just no matter what they did. But how was her legacy, you know, appreciated? Was it even or did it only recently come out? Good question. You know, as South Africa, you know, went down the dark tunnel of apartheid, Maheke's achievements disappeared. But I mean, Kai, we can talk about Charlotte Maheke for days. She, the Women's League that she founded, I mean, that became the ANC Women's League. You know, she was a church leader too. And really the grain of resistance that she sowed would inspire generations of South African women to really fight for equality to this day. I'm sure you can hear how passionate I am <laughs> as I speak about yeah. this woman. But honestly, <laughs> she was just such an amazing woman. And um, she's known as the mother of black freedom. Heck. I mean, she even has a South African submarine named after her. The list goes on and on and on. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> When we come back, we're staying in South Africa and following up on the women's movement into the apartheid years. But what do you do when the apartheid regime does not negatively affect you? Would you still stand up and fight? Well, we'll be meeting a woman who did just that. DW, African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. This is African Roots. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson Salami. Leila, Charlotte Macheke's story, you know, on many levels is just mind boggling, I think. I think we can both agree on that. <laughs> yeah, we do both agree on that, you know, especially when you're looking at it in the context of pre apartheid. And, you know, I find it also extremely interesting because it affects how I would also like to tell you the story of Helen Joseph, who is a very different character in many ways. But it gives us an indication of where the women's movement went in South Africa. Hmm. Okay, what makes you say so? Well, Leila, for one, Helen Joseph was a white political activist from a well-off family. And her story is that she basically risked her very life by challenging the apartheid regime. And the the weird thing about this is that the apartheid regime was literally built, you know, with the intention of protecting people like her. We live in a land, you and I, where a great measure of freedom is denied to the great majority of the people simply by virtue of the color of the skin. That's Helen Joseph speaking in the late 1980s. She was quite an old lady by then and recordings of her were rare for reasons we'll get into later. It's the great divide and we are quite blatant about it. Deny the basic rights to the majority of our people. So let's just start at the beginning a bit. Uh, Helen Joseph was born in England, not in South Africa, in England in 1905. Her nationality and her white skin meant that, you know, she could enjoy privileges that were beyond the dreams of most South Africans. And she actually emigrated to South Africa in the 1930s before, you know, apartheid had even really been introduced, at least formally. And she realized that this um, this white privilege that she had actually had a very negative effect, of course, on the black people that were around. You know, in many cases, dogs and cats of white colonizers were essentially treated better than the black majority, Leila. Yeah, that that is one way of putting it. So, you know, jumping ahead a bit here, because it's a bit of a long story here. In 1951, while working as a secretary director of the Medical Aid Society in the Transvaal uh, clothing industry, which was quite a big deal at that time, Helen Joseph joins the anti-apartheid struggle. And this was a dangerous move for anybody at this time. And it was essentially the last thing you would expect from well-off white people. I'll let Professor Kathy Albertain from the University of Witwatersrand explain just why this was the case. Even a short consideration of Helen Joseph's life reminds us of a time when to advocate for racial equality gave the state cause to ban, harass, arrest, detain, banish, criminally charge, imprison, torture, assassinate and murder countless thousands of South Africans. 
Okay, let's back up for just a second here. Do we know why um, Helen Joseph decided that she was going to give her all to the anti-apartheid movement? Well, Leila, it's hard to say, but there are a few ideas about this. First of all, she hadn't grown up in South Africa. She had studied. She had a degree from London University. She'd held a teaching post in India before moving to South Africa in her late 20s. So she'd she'd had a bit of a different sort of upbringing to the average white South African. And after World War II, she trained as a social worker and worked in the racially mixed areas of Cape Town, which weren't very many, but they did exist at that time. But it was really when she began working for the Medical Aid Society in South Africa's textile industry and garment industry where she realized just how bad conditions were for black people as well as people who were not white in, and, and that they had just basically very few rights or in some cases no rights. So Helen Joseph really started into the anti-apartheid movement as a trade unionist and really became a leading figure in the anti-apartheid movement in the 1950s. She led a coalition of white people who despised apartheid and supported black South Africans. She in fact read out parts of the historic Freedom Charter in Cliptown, the very famous Freedom Charter that is still quoted today, the one that begins, the people shall govern. Interesting. I mean, I'm guessing all of this came at a cost. Yes, that is right. Uh, Helen Joseph was banned from visiting certain areas and meeting people. She was also arrested at least four times for challenging the system that oppressed black people and also, you know, promoted white supremacy. You know, the authorities had an eye on her and they were watching her. And here's social development expert Leila Patel speaking at the annual Helen Joseph Memorial Lecture. You know, just what kind of attitude this woman had? She was an unwavering advocate of social rights, welfare rights, gender justice, and a more equitable and democratic society. Her passion, special leadership qualities, and excellent organizational abilities were harnessed to build a grassroots movement for social and political change and to give voice to women's demands in this process. If there's one definitive moment where Helen Joseph puts her mark on the anti-apartheid struggle, it's the Women's March to the government offices in Pretoria on August the 9th, 1956. One of their main objectives was to protest against pass laws. Leila, just so you know, women, all women, actually had to carry passes. Men didn't, but women had to carry passes in South Africa at that stage. Wait, Kai, are we talking about the same pass laws as Charlotte Maheke? Well, yes and, and no, but they were similar and they were basically pass laws that meant that women, no matter where they were, no matter what race they were, they had to carry passes. And by that time, apartheid had been codified into law and South Africa was, I'd, I guess you'd call it legally racist, if you will. Uh, anyway, nowadays, the 9th of August is a national holiday in South Africa. Here's President Cyril Ramaphosa speaking, you know, just about why Helen Joseph and many others who were on this march was such a significant part, I guess, of the grassroots struggle against apartheid. And it's even felt today. Women from all corners of our country arrived in Pretoria and what was fueling them was their determination to ensure that the past system is stopped and that apartheid is ended. There were 20,000 women. Wow, 20,000 women. You know, Helen Joseph must have really fueled serious rage across the apartheid government. Well, yes, um, her activities did draw attention and also rage from the state. Uh, Helen Joseph is known for uh, surviving assassination attempts where shots were just fired through her bedroom windows, where she was forced to crawl on the floor as bullets were flying over her head and shattering glass and anything in between. I think she was also treated differently, I guess, to other freedom fighters or anti-apartheid activists because she was a woman and also because the government just could not stand the idea that one of their own, one of their own white people was actually fighting the system, Leila. Exactly. You know, that, that's the thing that gets me here. You can just imagine in those times. Well, I mean, can't really imagine because it's that deep, but you can just imagine what it is for them to see one of their own, you know, um, fighting the very system that they've created. And it's certainly a different kind of courage um, that we see from Helen Joseph Kai. Um, was she ever charged for her activism? 
Well, in 1957, Joseph and others were accused of treason. So yes, they, <laughs> they were charged. And, that, and at that time, treason was, of course, a very serious charge. And also with subversive activities, which basically meant you had acted in disobedience of the apartheid regime. Um, however, Helen Joseph and others were acquitted in 1961. But Joseph was basically put under a house arrest for a year later for gathering supplies for families that were in exile, killed or banned. You know, in those days in South Africa, you could become a banned person, which meant that nobody could contact you. So it didn't just end there. Helen Joseph spent the next uh, 23 years under house arrest. Oh, wow. So she was under house arrest until the mid 80s. But by now, she must have been an old woman. Yes, she was an old woman at that stage. And uh, I don't think that any of the passion had really left her. You know, at least according to when you speak to people like ANC stalwart Carl Niehaus, who just describes this encounter, which I just think is so telling of what kind of person we're dealing with. I recall one morning after such an incident, when I arrived at her house and found her busy sweeping up the glass of the windows that had been shot out. There was fire in her eyes. She was extremely angry. And she kept on saying, they can kill us, but they will never kill the ideal of the struggle for freedom in this country. So as you can see, it didn't matter that this was an old woman who was just, uh, you know, uh, how how much of a threat could she be, I guess? But it didn't stop the apartheid agents from harassing her, threatening her, firing shots at her house, you know, watching her. I mean, she was 80 years old when she was unbanned in 1985. Uh, however, when that happened, you know, she famously said it was amazing to her that a weary old auntie like herself could be treated as a threat by the state security. And how that could happen, only they could say. You know, that's what's been on my mind as well. I mean, this is a woman who's in her 80s still being treated as a threat by her government. Um, yeah, but you know, Kai, it's a special kind of vendetta and an unbelievable show of courage that we see from Helen Joseph. That's right. And to be fair, it was also acknowledged later on by the incoming liberation movement, the ANC, when they took uh, power in 1994. Unfortunately, Helen Joseph wasn't alive to see the end of apartheid. She passed away in 1992. But the ruling ANC honored her with the Isitwa Landwe uh, Separanque Medal, which is the highest honor that could be given to outstanding individuals. And also, Leila, this is also interesting to know, in South Africa, you often see this slogan, uh, you know, either on billboards or you hear it on the radio or you hear people talking about it, or especially also at marches, you strike a woman, you strike a rock. And that line is is so often just really associated with Helen Joseph. Hmm, you strike a woman, you strike a rock. I love that. Um, but you know, Kai, it's actually um, really painful when you think about it that neither Charlotte Maheke or um, Helen Joseph would live to see the effects of their activism. That is true. But what I find uh, very fascinating about these both both these incredible women that we've spoken about, Charlotte Maheke and Helen Joseph, is that one can see where the activism that both of them uh, did in their during their specific eras and where it led to. And yes, one could say that they, neither of them really lived to see the fruits of their sacrifices or the end of the apartheid regime. However, I, I don't know where South Africa would be really without their efforts and without their sacrifices and the things they did. DW, African Roots. That's where we will have to leave things for today. African Roots is a cooperation between Deutsche Welle and the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Special thanks to our producers, Thomas Schmidt, Philip Zantner, and our voiceover artists. Contributions by Tuso Kamalo, Jackie Wilson, and Yulia Yaki. I am Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson-Salami. Join us again next time. Bye for now. <laughs>